Hello, welcome back to another week of European Tour Picks and Bets. New background here. Figured I got to shake up a luck a little bit, Tom. What did you think of last week on the Euro Tour? It was uh, it was just one of those weeks, right, on the European Tour. If you if anyone was backing Thomas Peters, you probably need an operation from Sky's lovely uh, workplace here. And um, you know anyone that was on Matthew Pavon. It felt a little bit harsh because it was kind of two bad holes as opposed to a reflection on his whole day. But it was, he played like a guy that was looking for his first win. And Peter's played like a guy that's always done the same thing regardless of the fact that he's got six wins now. So, um, you know, or five wins. But he's uh, a guy that isn't great in contention, despite the fact that he's won as many times as he has. For, for me... I mean, I was nowhere close. I mean, I guess Callum Shinkwin going into the weekend, I thought had a chance. You know, he did absolutely nothing Saturday and Sunday. Uh, was quite disappointing to, to track that. But such a big fan of Thomas Peters' game. It has the potential to, as we've always talked about, you know, do what he did um, at the Ryder Cup four years ago. You know, do what, or, um, you know, he's performed at the U.S. Open when I, I really thought they had a chance uh, to take it down. He's got that peak level game, but man, that was a tough watch on Sunday um, overall. But the best part for me on that Sunday was seeing Lucas Biergaard's emotion after his round. Um, I know there's been some, some conversation regarding what status is for some golfers, yeah, as like it's not all the way clear. Clear. Yeah, potentially that that might be okay for him either way. But um, just that performance he had down the stretch, the clutch putt at the end, um, great to see Biergaard with some status. Yeah, and, you know, he's deserved it, right? I mean, we we put it up earlier in the year. I can't remember it was. It was after the ISPS, wasn't it, where they didn't have strokes going days when I kind of said that I don't know how he did it last week, but it looks like he'd come back to something like his best um, and to maybe jump on. And we got on early and – Price was, was going downwards last week and I kind of wanted to jump off of it and hope that it went back up for the DP World Tour if he got there. Um, he nearly won, so it almost blew up in my face. But um, he, he he said as much as what I expected, that he doesn't have his whole game right now. His driving isn't where it needs to be. Um, you know, there's, there's some really good opportunities, par five, the drive will par four for him, which in his heyday he would have, uh, he would have cleaned up on. So... Despite the fact that he shot, what was it, a 66 in the final round, it it kind of was scrappy. So I think that's probably why he he was talking the way he was. And, you know, you can't take anything away from him. He got the job done. And the fact that he can do that and shoot a 66 when he admittedly doesn't have his best just shows what's going to happen when he does get back to his best. But the scorest part for me was Adrian Aus. I mean, kind of, you know, five over on the par fives yesterday, which was just tough. And it's become a bit of a pattern now. Yeah, it was. I mean, him, I know we talked about McIntyre in that mix with him almost to start the week and, and just nothing out of Bob either. Um, what I did enjoy following and actually still even now, um, as we have the Corn Ferry Tour Q School finals wrapping up, a uh, guy that we talked quite a bit up there in contention who's going to lock up some really good guaranteed starts this week uh, or this year and Vincent Norman. So excited for Norman. I mean, he could be a PGA Tour member in 12 months from now, which is amazing for that talent and how quickly he did it when his college team John Pock is like T40. You might not get any starts um, regarding the guaranteed status. So what a role reversal for those teammates. Um, so happy for Norman. And then Tom, can you pronounce the uh, winner of the challenge tour final uh, yesterday? Uh, no, I was hoping that was what you were going to do. So it's Nicholas Helikidi. Uh, you know, Mar Marcus, was... Marcus, Marcus Helikidi. Marcus. Yeah. Not even Nicholas. For some reason I had Nicholas in my head. Um, yes, he, he looks very good though, doesn't he? You know, all joking aside, he, he looks a great talent. Uh, Ricardo Gouvier put in a good effort yesterday as well, Julian Brun. So uh, I was actually quite sad not to see Matteo Manassero get through uh, after being kind of close all year. Um, but, you know, the guys deserve to get through that did. Yeah, I'm um, excited for Yannick Paul. Um, you know, we okay. I spoke about that over the weekend. Yannick gets through. Uh, Jeremy Paul, last I checked, was inside the top 12, um, also on the Corn Ferry Tour, so amazing for the brothers. Um, Nicholas Norgard Muller uh, was the other with uh, other Denmark. Um, Nicholas you know, Marcus, you know, Nick, it's he got through too. So he got through, I think, on the number he needed to birdie his last two holes and did. Uh, which is amazing. So no, just uh, a fun and we're going to have that, that season start early. Um, you know, I was looking at the schedule now seeing the three South African events oh, yeah. in, in December. So I love those ones. Um, I actually 
truthfully believe from our perspective, they might be the most popular end because there's no conflicting PGA Tour events. So that's when we see DraftKings prizes pick up. That's when the full attention of the golf market falls on the European Tour. So our research hopefully will be well paid off in those type of events. But we have two more in Dubai before we get there. So we can go right into uh, the Aviv Dubai Championship. Um, this is going to be a Jeremiah Golf Estates. Now there's two courses here. Earth course, which has always been the DP tour, uh, the world championship there at the end. That one has always been played there, but last year was the inaugural event on the fire course where we saw Antoine Rosner come through, uh, for his victory there, um, in a low scoring event. So we're going to see a lot of birdies. I think the course is quite open. I think would be a good way to describe it. There just wasn't much you had to do. I mean, if you struck it well, that was one thing, but you also had to put it quite well and arranging skill sets. Um, but a lot of short game special not specialist but short game um i guess kind of was needed in these birdie fests to to succeed so what's your thoughts overall on the course i so i've got to be honest I, I don't remember the event that well i just remember that andy sullivan had a great chance to win um and rosner kind of came back on the final day which is something that he's been accustomed to right we've, we've got used to seeing it uh from him on the european tour uh, he shot fine around 64 and actually opened up with 63 as well so it's only actually the middle parts that made it tougher for him uh, Andy Sullivan is shooting a 70 on the final day. Um, and I think he was, him and Ross Fisher were the only guys in the top maybe 15 or so uh, that didn't uh, fail to break 70. So, you know, it it was a tough scene for him, especially as he shot 61 on the uh, opening round, Andy Sullivan. But that's kind of him all over, right? You know, he's quite volatile. We know he can score low. We know he can make some mistakes. Um, I think the rest of the, the field itself, the, there were some familiar names up there. We'll come on to them a bit later on, but... Francesco Laporte, so Mike Lorenzo Vera, uh, you know, Ross Fisher, these guys that we see an awful lot in, you know, the Middle East, Andy Sullivan, of course, uh, Matt Wallace was up there as one of the favourites. So there wasn't too many surprises. I mean, you start getting down to kind of like Stephen Brown, Nicholas Lemke, they're, they're a bit, you know, a bit more shocking and Matt Schmidt a bit further down. But generally speaking, I think, you know, you're going to this week thinking as long as you, you're on the right line of thinking, the people that are in form, will prosper here, you know, guys that have played well in the Middle East, guys that are hitting their irons well, there shouldn't be too much to think about, I don't think, going into it. Yep, and it's, uh, I guess, a strong enough field where we're getting some decent odds. I'm, I'm not sitting here, you know, salivating over the mid-hundreds like I do in some of those weaker fields, um, you know, kind of settling in that mid-range with a few guys at the top. I mean, looking at what the golf markets were last week. We've seen that sweet spot come in the high teens, mid twenties, potentially Victor Hovland, of course, winning again last week. Um, but always like to find some each way value with it. Um, and because Paul Casey and Tommy Fleetwood are showing up, you know, that gives us a shot to have some of these guys. So off the top of the market, is there anybody who interests you there? It's really easy just to say Paul Casey, right? You know, I was just looking back and I was intrigued more than anything when I was looking back for the research, just to see, he doesn't come back on the European tour anywhere near as much as I thought he did. Um, I think I, I went back to 2015 before I got bored of tracking kind of his just European tour events, just in individuals. So no WGCs, no majors. And I think I counted 12 and he missed one cut during that time. And generally speaking, it was no worse than kind of like 11th or 19th. Like he is just so solid when he comes back into these events. Obviously one uh, in Dubai earlier in the year. Uh, or was it Qatar? I never remember which way around it. I think it was Dubai Desert Classic, um, which is obviously a good link to this as well. So for me, he's really, really hard to, to kind of rule out, um, but he's 11 to 1 for a reason. But it kind of highlights to me that, you know, Paul Casey's gone on to win on the PJ Tour back to back years not so long ago uh, and really elevated his game in the majors in recent years. And he's still sitting there at the same price as Fleetwood that's kind of having the problems. And, and I feel like I. I attack Fleet with an awful lot. I don't mean to because I like Tommy Fleet with a lot and he's a really, really good golfer. But it feels like he's now remaining in this kind of tier on name value only rather than kind of deserving it. I know he's been in decent form since, you know, coming up to the Ryder Cup and just after, but not really contending or winning form, I wouldn't say. When we talk, yeah, it's tough with Tommy. Like, I think the expectations are so high because they, they should be, I think they really yeah. should be, but he's so likable that like a glimpse of hope is like, okay, we're back. We're all in. We could bet him at an okay number, but like, it's, it's basically the Ricky, like I would say it's the Ricky Fowler type of situation yeah, that we saw, yeah. you know, Tommy's 
play didn't fall off to that degree, but um, didn't deliver anywhere that that was expected. So Especially I mean, not on this tour, right? Like PJ tour, he's kind of struggled, but but European tour, he he is he contends or he's expected to contend. And sorry to cut you off there, but just to kind of get my point that he is he's kind of deserving of the price in a sense, but there's nothing that intrigues me to dive in at him. Like there's nothing I've seen over the last couple of years that really makes me want to dive in at 11 to 1. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I, I would much rather, I mean, I, I love talent, you know, uh, of the degree and, and, you know, Weisberger kind of falls in an odd zone from that range to me, decent perspective, but I, I just, I have to back Min Woo Lee here. He's the one who stands out above the rest. I mean, we saw Thomas Peters in the odds market when they were initially initially released. So there was a 28 on Min Woo. It's down to 25. I think the best you can probably find maybe uh, over on your end, there's some 28 still that are here, but you know, that recent form, you see an eighth and a second out of him the last two weeks, of course, got it done twice in some of the biggest stages um, out there, you know, specifically at that Scottish open, but Kids full of talent um, potentially might play even better when the conditions are up. So it, it's, I could, you could make an excuse that that might be it, but I would rather, you know, think he's more deserving to be in that 20 to range 18s, you know, versus maybe a little bit more pedigree that these guys are getting uh, up to. So Min Lee is where I start my card. Yeah. And look, I, I kind of put it down to having, a lack of form in these Middle Eastern events, which is kind of ridiculous because he wouldn't have played a lot of them. Um, and then when you look at it, he kind of finished fourth in Saudi where he had weekend, you know, 63s as well. So there's no real reason to dislike him. I think anyone that kind of backed me really last week should probably look to do the same again this week um, with the added, added caveat of Paul Casey being in the field. But a guy messaged me on on Twitter earlier in the week and sort of said, is Mimu really like a guarantee? And I kind of said, well, no, I don't think he is. I think there's, there's kind of, guys around him that, that make more appeal to me personally. And, and I was kind of putting everyone else in that bucket, which is uh, disappointing. But, you know, he is now becoming the kind of player that you can rely on most weeks. Like when you look at, you know, when he won that Scottish Open, you could fully expect him to kind of take a dip and, and not really do much at the end of the year. He doesn't really need to. Um, 21st at, at Kranz, 12th at the Italian Open. And then, as you say, second and eighth the last two weeks. And what I liked about it was, He's gone from Valderrama, which is very, very tough and probably not, you know, kind of suited to him. He probably has a more open course like this week. Um, and then he goes and does it in a, in a birdie fest in Portugal as well. So I think you're right. I think he does like it when there's a bit more wind and a bit tougher and things like that. But, you know, there's, there's potential for that. And, uh, you know, it's not necessarily, we, we see every week we think it's going to get to 25 under and it gets to kind of 18, 19. So he's definitely got the ability and uh, is probably slightly overpriced compared to the people who are next to him. What's intriguing too, um, looking at the numbers as we go into next week. Um, and I mean, this often it's, I'm not one, and maybe I should be betting into the markets of like race to Dubai leaders or, you know, uh, FedEx cup winners because quantity of events often equals at least the opportunity on the European tour to be the winner of the race to Dubai because it's not as structured as what we see, um, on the PGA tour, but you could basically say that that Minwoo Lee has been the best full-time European tour player this year. I mean, he leads the points. He's played 19 events. If you look at the guys who are above him, you know, you have it just basically because of majors and then Hatton and Fitzpatrick there um, just above him. And then, you know, sandwiched between Paul Casey. And then you would say the next person who's had the consistency is crazy enough to say that Richard Bland is very live next week to win the race to Dubai. So it is interesting to look back on Minwoo's year and it could absolutely be capped with a huge win um, at either of these two events in the next week, uh, but excited for him. Uh, does Matt Wallace interest you at all? He does. Um, you know, I think he's underwhelming at times, especially on the European tour now. I think again, he's a bit like fleet, but he's kind of built up this kind of record that it's really hard for him to keep up and achieve. And when you listen, I listened to him do an interview with Claude Harmon recently, and he speaks about his desire to play both tours, how he's getting a better goal for despite his results, not showing it on the PJ tour. And I think that's, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And I think there's a lot of arrogance that isn't necessarily destructive, but actually does help him. Um, I, I think that he has got a kind of chip on his shoulder that he thinks he's probably better than he is as well. And thinks he's deserving of Ryder Cup spots, et cetera, et cetera. So 
you, you need to start winning more uh, and doing these sort of things. You know, we're seeing kind of like the, the Hogar twins now, um, you know, consistently contend in European Tour events. If you can't get a, go and get consistent finishes on the PGA Tour, like a Paul Casey uh, in that fashion, like Matthews Patrick this year, like Tyrrell Hudson, then you really need to come back and win these events over here. So I think this is a really good opportunity for him to perform well this week going into the tour ending. And I like what you said about Mimou Lee as well, being, you know, 19 events played, like you say, Richard Bland. I remember when we did the shows, but at the start, we were kind of taking yeah. the, you know, taking the mick out of Richard don't, Bland. Don't and, bring it up, Tom. It's still no, it, it, It's tough, but we did, didn't we? We kind of said, you know, when you look at the South African events last year and he was kind of throwing them away and you kind of think, well, that's just Richard Bland. That's what he's done for 30 years. And all of a sudden he's like the best player in the world. And he was doing it on a partially torn knee, which is even worse. But you look at the guys with, with those events, Mimu Lee, 19 in sixth place, Richard Bland, eighth place, 22. Your guy Guido, 20 in 12th. And uh, Wiesberger, 14th. And I, I just think that's quite alarming that Wiesberger, we, he's been putting his pedestal now for quite a while obviously got himself into, into the Ryder Cup and those guys are ahead of him. So I think that speaks volumes about them rather than him being disappointed. Yeah. Um, um, I'd say as we branch deeper into the board, I think there's specific standouts that that we'd walk through. Um, but I think it's it's worth talking everyone in that range, especially as DraftKings comes out. Uh, prices are, are still not out there, a little bit slower on these uh, these days because of because of the old football, Tom, but, um, but it's okay. We still, we still love um, what we got here, but let's go into your um, standout pick up top recent sunshine tour winner, right? Last week. Indeed. Dean Burmeister. And, and you remember George Cozier last year had won a, a sunshine tour event and then went straight into Portugal masters and won that too. And, and I just think Burmeister can do something similar here. Not, not to maybe suggest that he's as good as George Cozier. I think he's got, the talent to be um but i think it's you know it's presumptuous to say that he is the same um but I, but i do think that he is playing to that level i mean you, you look at the thing he won the tenerife open he followed that back up with fourth and sixth place finishes at the canary islands in the british masters sixth in the czech masters and then seventh at the alfred dunhill links before that win on the sunshine tour so you put that all together and then you look at his kind of middle east record and it's really quite encouraging you know he's got a third in the divide as a classic uh, two tied four finishes in the DP World Tour, which you know we've been talking about, is is a massive event for the European Tour. Seventh in Abu Dhabi, um, you know that's a that's a really good bank of form. Eleventh in the Saudi International as well. So he generally plays well in this part of the world, um, and, and I just think that that recent win, a lot of people find it hard to believe that he can go back to back, but it's kind of two different tours, and I, I just think that's fine for him. One thing Dean just loves is just going low, man. He loves a birdie fest. Just even when the conditions or other people aren't, he's somebody you can find beating stroke averages by three or four strokes, um, which seems way more likely um, than the field is able to. So, no, I'm excited for Dean coming off that. I absolutely think it's more of a kickstart versus a uh, sit back and celebrate. I, I absolutely agree with you there. Um, as we venture into the mid range, we're, we're starting with it. I'm, I'm embracing it head on Guido Migliazzi, 55 to one. You brought it up race to Dubai. He's in there. He knows the time is right. You know, he, he came out hot at Thursday in Mayakoba. He was like three under through like nine. And I was like, okay, he's going to have a torque card. You know, it'll be great. You know, he doesn't need any of that. He can just skip right there. He's already in all the majors. We're good to go, you know, but um, unfortunately the rest of the 27 holes that he had to play did not go as planned. So, but no, excited for him. 55s, of course, I'm going to be backing into that as he has a big couple of weeks ahead, but keep going into the, the mid range time. I know we agree um, on our next pick, the one I would go to at 66 to one. Um, if you want to talk through JB Hansen. Yeah, so he was one I was a little bit hesitant on. Uh, his price has come down slightly uh, in the UK, but I'm going to you know, plonk on, especially since you uh, said him as well. Six top 25 finishes in his last seven events, just the one missed cut. Um, hasn't got the best Middle Eastern record, but he's got a tied night from Qatar earlier this year, and he was tied sixth in Amman back in 2019. And those two finishes kind of just gave me enough of the stuff I wanted to see. Um, but it's just his ball striking, right? You know, the, the strokes gain approach in the last three starts, 21st, 8th, and 3rd. Um, so he's 14th best in the field uh, in the eight-week trackers. Obviously, a lot of players in there that are kind of not playing anywhere near as much events as him as well. He got that breakthrough victory, didn't he, in South Africa last year or the year before now? And uh, 
it's kind of not happened for him since, but I think there's more to do with just just one part of his game kind of not firing. And I think that if he can just keep hitting the ball the way that he is, he's going to break through again shortly. I never view him as like a specialist of anything. He's not somebody I can identify very well because I look for specific skills or specific like trending stats. And he, he doesn't seem to fit that bucket all that much. I do remember specifically he led the Olympics in strokes gained approach. Um, but yeah, he said a little bit of research with the irons. What I loved the most, if you look at the last five tournaments, um, and, and this is just, if you look at the last five events, whoever played, whatever, it's not, you know, last 20 rounds, but he is the leader in weighted birdie or better. And he has a significant sample size of it too, versus other 19 rounds in the last five events. And other people might have a little bit lower in the ability. If you only have four rounds, you might have a super high birdie or better average. And, and Hanson has just displayed that now for a significant amount of time. So definitely getting on him, uh, feel comfortable in this birdie fest, hoping he can kind of just have that all around game fire everywhere. Um, Tom, who's next for you? Grant Forrest was next for me. Um, you know, he's been pretty impressive this season. It's kind of been a breakthrough year for him. Uh, 9th, 18th and 16th in three of his last four starts and strokes can approach the irons are good. Um, you know, since winning the Heroes are a third and two top 27 finishes, including a tied 22nd last week. Um, and he played pretty well here last year, if I remember correctly. Um, I've just come off of that to, uh, to to have a look at the race of the buy ranking. So let me just bring it back up. Um, but I'm pretty sure he had a good finish uh, at the summer. Yeah, he was sixth last year, uh, final round 63 and a slightly over 66 as well. Um, third round 70, maybe kind of got caught up in the... Uh, idea of contending in a tournament, not something he'd been used to at the time. But now he's kind of got that win under his belt. This feels like the next natural progression, right? Like it's not a massive career defining win, but you've got Paul Casey, you've got Tommy Fleetwood, you've got Matt Wallace. These are the guys that realistically he can pit himself up against. Uh, he can't go to the PJ Tour yet and do that kind of thing. So this is the level that he needs to go and beat now. Mimu Lee, Bert Wiesberg, he'd that list as well. So I think it's a good opportunity for him ahead of the World Tour next week. Yeah, uh, and a course where you can take advantage of driving, I think Grant Forrest is always in play, um, especially after he's been over the the hump now. So no, I'm I'm a big fan of the talent. Um, we mentioned ball striking for Hanson. You know, it's something we look at almost every single week. I can't think of anybody else in a ball striking form without capitalizing on their finishes like Romain Lingask. It's uh, it's tough tough for him right now when it comes to around the green and specifically on the green numbers. Um, our friend Axis was tweeting about it this morning. Ben Coley has been pulling his hair out, backing Lingas, thinking that we would see something. I mean, through 54 holes, that guy was leading Tita Green last week and nowhere even on the first page, uh, you know, at SG Tita Green tweets it um, out the stroke scan after end of the rounds. And we don't even see the number one Tita Green guy on the first sheet of tweets, which is just incredible for, uh, you know, the fact of how well he's striking it. Can he find enough of a putter at a course where you need the birdies? That, that's a huge, huge ask. However, the number is just way better than what I've anticipated. That play has been so much better than what the results are finishing. And so if you get somebody at 70 to one who is showing that consistency over a decent period of time now, um, I'm always going to back that guy. The, the odds are just suggesting that it can't happen, which is kind of ridiculous. Like we know they can get hot whenever. Um, you know, it only takes somewhere that they feel comfortable. I've seen the reason why Langas can't do that. And like you say, the most important feature of your game is your irons and, and your tee to green in general. So if you haven't got that far and you've got real no chance, uh, there's no good being a good putter if you can't do anything else. So I'd rather he had that and found a short game uh, and he's got that to look forward to. But someone that he's hitting his irons really well again uh, is Alejandro Canazares. Yes. Know, uh, second, fifth, and thirteenth place finishes in the strokes gain approach in his last five events. Uh, he's third in the field in strokes gain approach, and I just think that he's he's a little bit underrated. Jason on our podcast really likes Jorge Campillo. I kind of put Canizares in a in a similar bracket to him, but he's a back to back top twenty fives. Uh, a third place finish in uh, Holland not so long ago. He was fifth in Abu Dhabi, fifth and eighth in Qatar as well back in the day. So when you look at who he's got beat by in those events. So in Abu Dhabi, Ricky Fowler won it, Peter second, Stenson and Rory third, Lauten Speed, Benny Ann and Seam inside fifth. That's a huge, like, that's an elite field. And then again in Qatar, Garcia won, Nico Inland second, uh, Rafa Cabrera Vedo third with Olison and Cozia. Like, 
they're just top class guys beating him. So I think that yes, you have got some of those this week, but he can go toe to toe with those kind of players. Yeah, and it's often quickly, I wouldn't say forgotten, but like another person that I'd almost throw in the category that I almost backed, um, whose finishes just all of a sudden we're seeing odds not correlated to what that run was recent as like Christopher Christopher Broberg mm-hmm. also being triple digits feels like kind of outrageous for what he's done. I mean, Canizaros had a really, really good run. Broberg showed that again last week with a 12th, they get up finishing 12th potentially. Um, but yeah, we, we get better odds than you you'd think in a middle tier strength uh, field. The one that I am rounding out with um, for me, and, and I debated long and, you know, if this is kind of the, the week to run back some of the same guys you had, do you want to attempt Shankman again? Do you want to go with Kiros? Their ball striking numbers remained very similar to what it was. It was just like, do you pull the plug or do you think they can come through? The one that I thought was trending up into last event and was kicking myself on Thursday morning when I woke up, you know, Bertazio um, had some, some kind of numbers that looked like, okay, at the odds that he had, it was okay to go in a vacuum and he shoots a 10 under on Thursday. It's almost bad luck. It feels that, you know, these guys that are going so low on Thursday just haven't been able to keep up what it was. I think of James Morrison when we had backed him not that long ago for clear of the field, just like Bertazio was. And then, you know, I don't even know if Morrison placed, but I don't think he did. Um, But just Nino, back-to-back weeks, incredible irons, knows how to birdie, um, can find it. And and that's enough for me at 100-1 to to round out my card there. And a really good bounce back from Patazio as well after a 74 on Saturday to kind of fall out a bit of 67 on the Sunday to kind of show a bit of metal, place in that top five, because that's important, you know, they're big points to up for, uh, good record, good finish and a decent field. So that was good. I was surprised you didn't go for Broberg actually when you gave him a list and I'm surprised he was actually that big because the, the, the talent level is ridiculous. And since he's got that win, he's actually kicked on and improved probably than, than what he was playing that week. You know, it was a lot of uh, short game driven that week. Callum Shinkman, another one that had a really poor weekend and that kind of put me off. Um, but that was the only thing. But to, to finish my card is Mike Lorenzo Vera, uh, who's a guy that's kind of a Middle East, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, expert because he's never won before, but that's kind of where he relishes the task. Uh, he's had two missed cuts recently, but they were kind of on the number or just out of there. Uh, but back to back top 25 in Spain before that. And his last real shot of contention was this event last year when he finished tied second and he shot 66, 66, 65 to close. Um, we know what he can do in this part of the world. You know, best ever finish in the OWGR was uh, third at DP World Tour, second and fourth in Qatar, eighth in the Dubai Desert Classic. Oh, he just loves this part of the world. Very talented golfer. Not been at his best this season, which is why he's getting 125 to 1 instead of kind of like 60s or... 40s even that we kind of used to him back in the day um and I, and I do still believe that the talent's there to break through and i have noticed this guy as we've been talking which is why i'm slightly distracted that they have released the pricing for DraftKings, uh, so we can maybe have a a little look through some of the, the 7k guys and sub there just to give some uh, some heads up there but yeah i think it's uh just while you bring those up i think it's a tough week to kind of pin down any four or five golfers i think there's a a wide open bracket. I looked at Ollie Wilson, who's been playing really well recently, uh, at long odds, but I couldn't pull the the trigger there. But yeah, I mean, Patrick Harrington's playing well as well. So I think there's a lot of long odd guys that could really come through. But for me, it was just trying to stick to those guys that could realistically win. Yeah. And, and I mean, full disclosure, I mean, I haven't been anywhere sniffing the leaderboard, you know, when it comes to my selection. So I think in those weeks, it's good to at least dial in to who you're who you're really going to be after. And of course, can talk exposures on DraftKings too, as you know, if you're going to play a handful of lineups, you can get more than just your selections on the betting board. The one that I would pick out at a value um, who ended up finishing seventh at the Portugal Masters uh, was in the mix last year. Francesco Laporta definitely does like a, a low scoring affair. Um, he is only $7,300 this week, not somebody who is fairly consistent. Um, so, you know, we see him with a fourth, sixth, miscut, 39th cut, uh, and then a seventh place finish. So to have three top tens in the last six events, be priced down there with his history. Um, I like that. Um, let's see. MLV is only seven K that seems like a fair 
Broberg, 6,900. Who else is saying that? Well, Canazares is 6,800. That feels like a steal. Yeah, you've taken the guys out of my mouth there. Nicholas Lemke as well played well here last uh, last year and played well recently. He's 7K as well. Um, I think that it's a decent buyback spot for uh, Renato Paratore. I think that kind of one thing just went wrong and that was it. Stillborn Ollison's really against the wall now before a impeding court case. So he made it a big week this week before that comes in. Um, but uh, again, I don't think we need to go this far down. Uh, I think you can build pretty good balanced lineups for what we've been putting out, you know, the Tazio 7,500, Shinquin 7,600, Forest 7,700. Like they're the guys that are going to build up your kind of teams this week. Victor Perez was very impressive, bouncing back from a really poor start. He's only 8,300. He could be some good value there as well. Yeah, and, and even having Min Wu starting alliance at 10.3 is, is very fair um, to, to build that balance roster. Very surprising um, as I scroll down to the bottom to, to see how far our friend Daniel Van Tonder has fallen. 6,100 this week. It hasn't made a cut in quite some time. 250 to 1. The outright, um, he was somebody at these type of courses that I didn't hate attacking, but I don't know if we have enough um, on Van Tonder's current form. Guido got a little price. Um, so d- discuss here, Tom Lewis. We don't have clarity, correct, regarding his his status? No, I think that the idea is that he is keeping his status based on what he got last year. Okay. Um, but Ben Coley seems to think that he may have a less than challenge tour level ranking, which is, you know, really worrying for him. So it may be that he needs a really, really good week. He might need to win in order to actually keep his card. So it's all a little bit up in the air at the moment. The European Tour haven't kind of communicated that very well. If you had to believe their website, he certainly hasn't got a card. If you believe the Sky commentary, he hasn't got a card. So it'd be interesting to see how that unravels, and we probably should get some clarity in, in commentary during the week. Yeah, and I think we'll spend some time um, – previewing as we maybe, you know, start the South African swing, um, you know, going through some of these guys that might've gotten elevated status or fallen out and walk through. Um, as I wrap up here, I took one more look at the Corn Ferry Tour leaderboard. Um, we see right now co-medalist uh, Vincent Norman, Fisher and Cozen are all at 13 under with one hole to play. Barring either of those two birdieing the last, Vincent Norman's going to have full Corn Ferry status for the year, which is huge for him. Jeremy Paul, T11. Um, so he's going to be in there. And this is an interesting one, Tom. Coming over from the Pro Golf Tour, um, Thomas Rosenmuller shot an eight under today to come from plus three, way outside of the number to finish inside the top 12. He tied with Jeremy Paul there at T11. Um, that's a huge difference for basically being nowhere to play next year to having a good amount of guaranteed starts. That is fun for him. Um, but, um, I think I'm going to spend a good amount of time also leading into our, our challenge tour graduate previews. Um, working into that uh but i think that wraps it up from my end before going through our card anything else for you no i think that's pretty good i think it's an event that i find really hard to not to get excited about something excited about most weeks but i think it's we're kind of just waiting for next week right and then we're waiting for the start of new seasons get your challenge talk guys in so i think we're kind of looking ahead to the world tour and, and the south african events and this is kind of a road bump with a few selections in, in the middle yeah would agree and uh, let's go through your card then to wrap it up Yep, so Dean Burmeister at 28 to 1. Really like his chance of coming off a, a Sunshine Tour victory. Grant Forrest and JB Hansen at the 60 to 1 mark. Alejandro Canazares at 125 to 1, as well as Mike Lorenzo Vera at the same price there as well. Awesome. I will be on Min Woo Lee, 28 to 1. Guido Migliazzi, 55. Joachim B. Hansen, 66. Romain Lengas, 70. And Nino Bertazio, 100 to 1. And, you know, often kind of working your guys on DraftKings exposure. So hopefully get back in the swing. Let's knock out a winner, Tom. Let's get hot to end the year. Get back our fire and we can go in strong. Yep. I mean, let's, let's do it. Burmeister and Minwoo Lee be good for one of us to, uh, to kind of stand out. We're yep. both quite convicted on, on those two. And uh, it'd be nice to, to finish it off well before the uh, Tour Championship. Yep. Amen to that. So thank you as always, Tom. And if you guys are wanting to subscribe to our audio platforms, Daily Fantasy Sports Picks and Bets, The Mix, you can find that anywhere in your podcast platforms. Rate, review, subscribe for us. It goes a long way. We really appreciate you guys and look forward to seeing you for the championship next week.